everyone knows that Christianity is opposed to being LGBT, right? If you scan through most denominational statements from Christian churches, you'll find near universal condemnation of LGBT people and our lives and love. This was pretty awkward for me when I was studying to become a Christian pastor and I realized that I was gay. Now, up to this point, I had had some inclination I wasn't straight, but I believed that by going to be a pastor, God would heal me of my sexuality and life would go on. That is until the first week of school at the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago, where I was studying to be a pastor, when there was a knock on my dorm room door. I answered, and there was a handsome young man there who invited me to go for coffee with him. Now, evangelicals sometimes do this strange thing when we go for coffee with one another. We begin to confess our sin struggles in hopes that the person across the table can help keep us accountable for our minor moral infractions and we can overcome our sins. After this young man confessed his sins to me, he said, there's one more thing, I'm gay. And in that moment, the world stopped. My jaw dropped, and the words flew from my lips. Me too. For the first time, I had confessed that I also struggled with my sexuality, and that opened up Pandora's box for me. So I did what I knew how to do. I began studying the Bible, going to the ancient archaeological sites around the world and actually meeting with theologians and pastors trying to understand what the Bible actually teaches about sexuality. And my curiosity revealed to me that what my tradition teaches wasn't quite as clear as I once thought. So over the next few moments, I want to show you a little bit about what I learned in that time of studying and show you how curiosity can help us open our minds and expand our perspectives. First, did you know it's quite literally impossible for the Bible to condemn homosexuality? Because the word homosexual and the concept of modern sexuality didn't exist until the late 19th century. The Bible didn't have the word homosexual in it until 1946, when the writers of the Revised Standard Version of the Bible placed that word in the Bible as the translation of a mysterious Greek word, arsenokoitai. This word arsenokoitai was so mysterious because it never appeared in the Bible until these, uh, the Apostle Paul places it in the Bible, and it was never in the Greek language up until that point. And it's only used sparingly afterwards. Now, scholars believe this word comes from the book of Leviticus, 1822, where it says, a man shall not lie with a man, as with a woman, for this is an abomination. The word man there in Greek is arson, and the word to lie with is koitin, and so people believe that the Apostle Paul combined those two words together to create arsenokoitai, to refer to whatever Leviticus was referring to. Now, what exactly is Leviticus 18.22 referring to? It seems clear, a man shall not lie with a man as with a woman. But if you scroll out a little bit, you'll begin to realize it gets a little murkier. Leviticus 18, verses 1 and 3 say, Do not do as they do in the land of Egypt, where I am bringing you from, and do not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you to. Do not follow their practices. Leviticus 18 is a part of the Hebrew Bible known as the Holiness Code. This is a section of law given to the ancient Jewish people to help keep them ritually and culturally pure from the nations that surrounded them. This isn't an ethical code, but a ritual and cultural one. And if you look through Leviticus 18, you'll find a bunch of prohibitions on things like incest and child sacrifice. And then this strange command, do not lie with a man as with a woman. So in order to understand what this verse means, you have to ask, where in ancient Egypt and Canaan was it permissible for men to engage with other men? Well, if you look at ancient Canaanite and Egyptian law, it's quite clear. Homosexuality was, in general, prohibited. So scholars have deduced that what was likely being referred to was one of three things. First, Verse 22 could refer to something called sacred prostitution, which was an act where men and women would go and engage sexually with temple priests and priestesses to honor pagan deities. The second thing it could be is uh, incest. Leviticus 18 contains almost 12 commands against incest, never against same-sex incest, and thus that could be a legitimate interpretation. Third, it could also be a command against exploitation. In many ancient cultures, it was permissible for men to engage with their slaves as a way of dominating them. Whatever interpretation you choose to take, what seems clear is that 
Whatever's being condemned is nothing like modern, loving, consensual same-sex relationships. Now, if you zoom out a little bit more and look at ancient sexuality in general, you'll find that the way the ancients conceived of sexuality is so different than our modern notion. Today, we believe sexual identity is innate. We are wired to be attracted to one gender or another or a spectrum of genders. But in the ancient world, it wasn't about what gender you were attracted to, but the social status of the person you were engaging with. So in the ancient Greco-Roman world of the Apostle Paul, if you were a Roman man, it was permissible for you to engage sexually with anybody who was lower on the social hierarchy than you, man or woman. Now, if that's truly how the ancients viewed sexuality, and we reject that patriarchal ordering of the world, and we concede that Leviticus isn't talking about anything akin to modern, loving, same-sex relationships, can we truly say that the Bible is condemning homosexuality? To me, it seemed we couldn't. One of my favorite teachings of Jesus comes at the end of his life. He gathers with his disciples and said, I have so much more to teach you, more than you can now bear. But when I go, I will send the Spirit who will lead you into all of the truth. Jesus tells his disciples that the Spirit was going to continue to teach them new knowledge, more information than they could now perceive from where they stood. This idea of reformation and learning is central to not just Christianity, but all religions. Hardwired into many faiths is the desire and the need to rethink and reform our perspectives. My purpose here today isn't necessarily to convince you about what the Bible says about homosexuality, but rather to invite you to be curious. Because when we begin to ask questions and re-examine our beliefs and perspectives, whether religious, philosophical, or political, our minds can be changed and more people can be welcomed in. You see, my examination of the Bible and my tradition has led me to believe that being gay and Christian is not a contradiction. And that's allowed me to step into my identity as both a gay man and a Christian pastor. But it's also empowered me to question other beliefs I had, asking who is being excluded by these beliefs and why. Today, I want to invite you to be curious, to take a hard look at what you believe and ask whose voices aren't you hearing. And then take some time and do the effort to listen to those unheard voices. Because when you do, your perspectives might be changed. You might expand. At the end of the day, everything is more complex than it seems. And absolutely everyone is worthy of love and acceptance. Thank you.